Amen. So, what I'd like to do, a little bit different, everybody who is under the age of 21, everybody, that means little kids, yes, right? Everybody who's under the age of 21, come forward. Everybody who's under the age of 21, even if you're visiting, come forward. Even if you're visiting, I promise I won't try, I'll try not to embarrass you. I embarrass myself all the time, just ask my wife Beth. Okay, turn around. You stand up here, I want you to turn around. Okay? I want you to understand, if you didn't read your bulletin, what the message title is today. Did you read that? No. Okay, it says, let me remember it, i got to read it. It's in need of a modern reformation. Keeping the status quo means death. I want you to reach over to you. Take your left hand. Everybody, just humor me. I'm silly. Take your left hand. Grab your right forehand, a forearm like this, and pinch yourself. And say that I'm alive in Jesus. If you're alive, if you're alive in Jesus, guess what? It's not about you. It's about them and the generations to come. And everyone who's mature in Jesus and mature in Christ, your life is a living sacrifice. And what you are sacrificing it for is these people and their children and their children's children. All right? So now you've got a face that you can pray about. All right? You can sit down now. Thank you for humoring me. The future of our church. The future. Yeah, oh, well, you were just here for show. Because <laughs> you're so handsome. I'm famous. You are famous. Amen. <laughs> it's true. You are. And Jesus, you are famous. He wrote a story about you before you were born, even. So I'm going to get into this message. But first, I want to kind of preface the message before we go to the focus passage and think about this message is, you know, it, it is going to be the 4th of July, right? And you heard me mention or make the comment that the reason that we celebrate the 4th, one of the main reasons we celebrate the 4th of July, believe it or not, is because our forefathers, our founding fathers had vision. They had a vision. Now, sometimes we make make the mistake, and it's not a statement of condemnation. Sometimes we make the mistake of just desiring the status quo and just being okay with the little bit that we have. And in some cases, I think that's okay, and yet it's not okay. Why is it not okay? Because all of those young people that came forward, it is our responsibility to develop their inheritance, Amen. physically, spiritually, in every way, it is our responsibility as those that are mature in Christ to develop their inheritance. And the hope is that we will draw them into encounters with the Holy Spirit. Because oftentimes when we see young people leaving and departing the church, it could be one of the reasons is that they have not truly experienced that life transforming, that shaking encounter with the Holy Spirit from us as a family collectively so that then they're drawn to the Holy Spirit in us. It happens. It's not a statement to condemn. It's a statement of part of the reality that we're faced with. So that's why we titled the message. You know, this pastor, he has these long titles. He can't even remember his own titles. Right? We do need a reformation. We need a transformation. You can just look at the culture around us and see that the status quo is not necessarily a good thing right now, is it? You know, I have had people ask me about some of the way God actually designed me as an artist as I continue to use art as a language to bridge generations and to connect people. 
That's why me as an artist, that's why I use that. That's why we're in the process of developing a building for the purpose of arts and outreach. Why? Because God designed me. It's part of my vision. And because God brought me here, it's part of your vision. And believe it or not, the Board of Administration has adopted this vision. Why? Because it's the pastor's responsibility in our form and should be in every form. Leaders' responsibility should be to bring vision and should be to stretch you because the status quo is what brings death. If we're just comfortable with the way that we are and we're looking back to the way things were, we are signing our own death warrant. We are actually saying to the generations to come, I live in the past, I love the things that were, you need to be like that. That's not the voice of God. Not really. I'm not talking about compromise and sin. I'm talking about having vision, having future. If we are a people who are preparing for doom and gloom, and we're the survivalist, and all we speak over our young people is, the end is coming. You're going to die. It's doom. The Russians are going to come across the water. The Chinese are going to be on their backs. The Koreans, the North Koreans are going to blow us up. If that's the way that we think and we feel, what are we instilling into those young people? Is there any hope? Is there any vision? Is there any strength or joy or peace in that? No, there's not. So if you want to open up your Bibles, that would be your book or your iPad or your iPhone, whatever works for you. And I'll open my, if I can figure out how to operate this thing. Isaiah 54.2. Now oftentimes when preachers preach about vision, just my theological opinion, <laughs> it's actually not really good exegesis. Exegesis, meaning I use the scripture to prove the scripture. I leave it in context to say that without vision, the people perish and use that for a message. It's okay to talk about vision. Because contextually, I don't personally think that's good. But that's just me. Why did I say that? Why? Because this passage is talking about vision. And then we're going to look in the New Testament and actually look at an underlying issue when we see the patriarchs of faith who did not experience the actual vision or the blessing that they did. They did see but how they come. Moses didn't enter into the promised land. Abraham didn't see all the sands of the seashore and the, the stars in the sky, the numbers of his offspring. David didn't see the fulfillment of the temple being built. Why? Because it's not about them. The blessing is the inheritance to the generations to come. We live our lives for a purpose not of ourselves. If we are mature in Christ and full of the Holy Spirit, our purpose is not for ourselves, but for the generations to come. So Isaiah 54, 2 says it this way. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. It's talking about expansion. Could you imagine if you go back to our forefathers and, and they didn't actually think that they could overcome the British? Could you imagine going back to our forefathers and during Indian Wars or, or whatever or going into World War I or World War II where they didn't think that they could defeat the Nazis or the Japanese? Could you imagine if you go back into the story of David and the, the mighty men of David? You might not know this story, but there were mighty men of David who took on dozens, hundreds of people on their own. Why? Because they had faith 
They had vision. They had strength. They decided that their God is more powerful than the words of men. That their God is more powerful than the status quo. That their God is so powerful that they, by faith, in Him, in His will, could move mountains. That's the God that we serve. That's the inheritance that we're supposed to be speaking and creating for the generations to come. The status quo, if you've never read this in a dictionary or anywhere, for whatever reason, some people like myself are strange and we like to read dictionaries. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh. Okay, it's all right. The status quo is a Latin phrase meaning existing state of affairs. You may know that already. But the word actually, or the term, actually comes from something deeper. French, Latin, Latin, French. It comes from the term, and I'll transliterate, I'll translate it, from before the war, as things were before the war. See, this phrase actually was a picture about, gee, we wish things would be as though they were before the war. See, this phrase is kind of like this. Gee, I wish things would be like that revival that was 30 years ago. Or gee, I wish things would be like the church filled the way that it was and the way that we worshiped and the things that we did like it was back then. Now, that's not always bad. But think about it. That has nothing to do with faith. Why? Because you've already experienced it. You've already seen it. It's already happened. Faith, in this sense, the way that I'm talking about it today, is to have a vision that's never happened. To see things that they never were. And believe that they will be. You see, there's a, a piece of dirt that we cleared out there because we have vision that there will be a building there that was not there before. Why? Because that building represents a calling of communicating through the language of art to those that are lost and disenfranchised and those that don't know Jesus. And oh, by the way, if you don't have a relationship with a person, it's really hard to speak Jesus into their lives. So learning to develop a relationship using some form that's what we're all called to do. It just so happens that that's part of my design, the way that I'm built. And I'm here because God called me, whether you like it or not, I'm here. Whether I like it or not, I'm here. We like it. We like it. Good. 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 Right? So we're not looking for the status quo. As we read in Isaiah, he might say, well, pastor, how are you? You're exegetically, this is not the way that applies here either. <laughs> you just said it about the other passage, right? No, it's a picture of, if, of Israel, right? It's a picture of Israel who has lost their way and who is, through the prophet Isaiah, is being called back to God. And how are we called back to God? By stretching our tent pegs, by broadening our borders, by having a vision and a faith that is not something that we can see financially, nor do we even have it, nor do we have that building out there, nor do we see that our neighbors who are lost or disenfranchised are now possessed by Jesus. Having a vision that everything we do physically, financially, spiritually, emotionally is to advance the kingdom of God and we will see hundreds if not thousands come to God. Amen. That's Faith, that's vision. That's what it's talking about. Be bigger, have more than, no, you know, I can't do this because I can't see it. You know, sometimes it's actually a really good thing. I'm not suggesting this. Don't get frightened. But sometimes it's actually a really good thing for a church to actually go out and get alone. Did you know that? Why? Because now you've committed it. Now you have no option. You've stepped into a vision and you've begun to step out in faith in a way that you may not have stepped out before. Now I'm not suggesting that that's what God is saying to me. So don't be afraid. What I'm saying is we need to be a people of belief and faith that we can see greater things than we've seen before. 
and that the outcome will even be greater than what was because God's desiring to do new things always, always. And God is a God that's asking us to follow him a fire by night and a cloud by day. Why? Because he wants us to follow him, not the status quo, not was, not what was. So as we go on, let's read it even further. We're going to read a whole bunch today. And you're going to fall asleep because we're reading so much. <laughs> Hopefully not. Isaiah 54, 1 through 17. Let's go back and look at this whole passage. It says, shout for joy, O barren one. How many of you know that the church in numbers is shrinking? It's not about numbers. And yet it is about numbers. Why? Because the size of the family it gives the power and authority, right? By two or three are gathered together in my midst. What? Okay, so we can have two pray, and it, 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 it grows exponentially. If three prayer, it, it's, it's, it's even more. If two, two or three are connected, if four are connected, if five are connected, more power, more presence, more of God pouring out in them and out through them for the purpose of drawing the lost and the disenfranchised to God. More Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no children. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud. You who have not travailed, for the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pigs. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will wrestle the desolate, great resettle, not wrestle, resettle the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame, and do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remain no, remember no more, for your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth, for the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the days of Noah. To me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again, so I have sworn that I will no, not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you, for the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord. And who has compassion on you? O oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comfortable, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, and your foundations will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystal and your entire wall of precious stone. All your sons will be taught of the Lord and the well-being of your sons will be great. In righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression for you will not fear and from terror for it will not come near you. If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fall because of you. Be behold, I myself have created a smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Are you a servant of the Lord? And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Are you a servant of the Lord? Stretch out your tent pegs. Don't be comfortable. There's a gate to hell that is so wide and people are going into it by the millions. 
And we should be the people who stand in front of the gate and say, no, you will not enter in in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's the generations to come. Our assignment, the Great Commission, is all about taking the gospel message throughout all of the world. And oh, by the way, it's healing the sick. It's giving sight to the blind. It's opening deaf ears. It's raising the dead. Wow. Let me see you do that one, Pastor. Right? Jesus said we would do greater things than he did. How in the world is that possible? The Holy Spirit, if we believe what we believe, then we will believe not in the study of salvation that the Holy Spirit's only job is just to bring salvation. Soterology, right? We saw that in a video. Right? It's not just that. That's part of it. But the Holy Spirit is here to manifest God's presence and truth and power through us so that everything that's expressed in the Word of God including miracles and signs and wonders and prophecies and tongues. All of it is real. Why? To perform in church? No. To save the lost. To draw the lost. To bring back the disenfranchised. Because when God shows up in that way, people are shaken. They're like, wow, what is this? I wonder. A sign and a wonder, right? What is this strange thing? If you read the stories of the Bible, you see all kinds of strange things. Some that would get you arrested if you tried them today. Strange things. I mean, who in the world would spit in their hand and stir up mud and then rub it in somebody's eye? Jesus did that, right? Who in the world would lay on top of a dead one, a young person, an older man? You'd go to jail for that. And then see that person brought back to life. You see, God is desiring to move. But sometimes we don't want to move with him. We have to stretch out our tent pegs. We have to broaden our borders. We have to truly believe what we believe or we say that we believe. Now, I got a whole bunch of reading here. I'm not going to read it all, but I'll give you an assignment. If you want it, please do it. There won't be a test next week, I promise. I want you to write down, if you would, or remember Hebrews 11, 1 through 40. Hebrews 11, 1 through 40. So you're probably thinking, I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but write that down. So why is this Isaiah 54 passage for us today? Because you are a servant of the Lord. I am a servant of the Lord. This is a picture and a type, not only of Israel, but of any people, group, that belongs to God, who has moved away and needs to be restored. We need a reformation. This nation needs a reformation. The people of this nation need to be reformed. It's not going to happen because we say it's going to happen or desire it. It's going to happen because we become the reformers that Christ through us becomes the reformers, that Jesus living in us, the fire of God in us, that's what brings reformation. That's what brings revival, repentance. Every area of my life, God, that is not in your will, needs to be repented of and transformed in Jesus' name. Every thought needs to be 
brought into captivity and measured and weighed through the filter of your word and your spirit. I need to, Pastor Dan Goddard needs to be transformed. And oh, by the way, so do you. Amen. That's the kind of reformation, revival, transformation that not only we need, but this nation needs. The people of this country need. This is what was going on. This is why this passage is important to us because it's a picture of the past. It's also a picture of the present. Proverbs 13, 22. It's talking about inheritance. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Even that that is not in God, the sinner, all of their wealth is stored up. Hebrews 11, 1 through 2. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of, good, of old gained approval. So if you opened up your Bibles, if you wrote this down, Hebrews 11, 1 through 40, you may not be able to follow along with me now. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval by faith. We understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gift and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. You heard me say that it's not about them and the blessing that God is giving them as much as it is. The blessing is for the future, for the future to come. It talks about Noah. It talks about Abraham. It talks about the saints of old that they inherited something. They had a blessing of God and they did not see the outcome. Why? Because it's for the generations to come. It's not for me. So if you're comfortable, I hope you're no longer comfortable. Why? Because we need to get up and stand by faith that we are world transformers, that we are revival bringers, that we are full of the fire of God and we will not settle for the status quo. By faith. You want the nation to change? Then bring it. It's your job. It's our job. It's my job. Let's pray.